Hi, and welcome to our second lecture on development. This will be lecture 16. In this lecture, we're going to start off by discussing a couple of very general research methods that developmental psychologists use to study development. Then we'll talk about the development of moral reasoning. The next step will be to talk about the development of our relationship styles. Then we'll talk about theory of mind. And if we have time, finally we'll discuss Eric Erickson's theories of how we develop as psychological social beings. So first, let's talk about studying babies. Now, uh, students in my class know that one way to study adult behavior is to ask people what they think or feel or believe. Maybe to sit them down in front of a computer and have them complete uh, tasks. But you can't do either of those things with babies, right? They don't tell you really, at least not with words, uh, what they're feeling in any consistent way. Um, and it's hard to give them complex tasks. So developmental psychologists have to be especially careful and tricky about how they study development with infants. So what is cross-sectional research? Well, let's say that you want to understand how people mm, develop a sense of moral reasoning. And you're interested in the period of time between, say, five-year-olds and 20-year-olds. Well, with cross-sectional research, what you do would be to develop a task and find a bunch of five-year-olds and give them the task, and then a bunch of six-year-olds and give them the task, and keep going like that, and then find 20-year-olds and give them the task. In other words, you find people of different age groups and you study them at the same time. Okay. Um, this is terrific at identifying differences, developmental differences, at different ages. And it's a relatively quick and inexpensive way to conduct research. But it has some important disadvantages. Um, and the big one that I want to tell you about is something called a cohort effect. You can also think of it as a generational effect. Turns out people of different generations, or people born at different times, have different sets of experiences. So for example, if I wanted to study attentional changes in attentional processes, and I studied old folks such as myself and then people in their 20s, well, you, 20-year-olds, grew up in a very different world from the world that I grew up in, right? I, I never used a computer before I was in college um, because they weren't generally accessible. So your experiences in life have been very different from my experiences in life. And so differences that you and I show on the same test, do they reflect our differences or do they reflect developmental processes, things that change over life? This is a problem with cohort effects. Let me give you another example. Let's say that you were a medical researcher and you wanted to understand aspects of lungs and how lungs change as we age. Well, if you are going to conduct research with very old folks, um, maybe let's say 90-year-olds or even 80-year-olds, um, and compare them to the lungs, compare their lungs to the lungs of 20-year-olds, you've got a very big confound. And that is that people who are 80-year-olds now were much more likely to smoke as 20-year-olds than 20-year-olds now, right? Lots of people used to smoke in the 40s, so there's very big environmental differences. Um, and so that creates a confound that cross-sectional studies can't really overcome. So there's a limitation. It's fast, it's terrific in lots of ways, but this methodology has that cohort problem. So you might say, okay, let's get rid of the cohort problem. Let's study people of a particular age group and let's say CSUN freshmen, study them now and then study them again in five years and then in 10 years and 15 years. That would be a longitudinal design. 
where you take the same participants, maybe everybody of a particular age or at a particular university, and you study them over and over and over again. Now, um, this has the advantage of there won't be any cohort effects because everybody of the same age um, will have grown up in much more similar circumstances. And it is going to give you terrific data about individual differences and early markers and all sorts of great stuff. But longitudinal studies have their own drawbacks. First, they are super expensive and work intensive because before you can publish your research results, you may have to wait 20, 30 years. So those long, expensive studies are tough. And what happens over the course of 20, 30 years? Well, something called attrition. It's going to be harder and harder for you to find your subjects as the study gets longer and longer, right? It's easy to find someone tomorrow who you ran in a study today, but to find them 20 years from now or 30 years from now, that's really hard. And maybe 20 or 30 years from now, even if you find them, they don't want to participate anymore. They're bored with it. Attrition. So you lose a lot of participants over time. And then you also have something called practice effects. If you're giving people the same study over and over and over again, the fact that they're doing the same tasks over and over again in and of themselves may be the reason for some change. So both of these studies have advantages and drawbacks. Come back and we're going to talk about moral development.